you all for coming. Uh, my name is Laura Bastian. I'm Congressman Diana Gett's Legislative Director. And I just want to say welcome and um, give a few welcome remarks. Uh, Representative Gett worked with ESI to set up this briefing because the impacts of climate change in the Southwest pose a very serious challenge. As you can see from this truly excellent panel, everyone is facing the challenge of climate change. State and local government, federal agencies, landowners, and philanthropy are all feverishly working to respond. But they are sometimes hampered by a patchwork of jurisdictions and authorities, state lines, state, federal, private lands, and diverse water right regimes, just to name a few, while their foe knows no boundaries. The groups here today are working together and getting results. But Rep Representative DeGette believes that Congress should pitch in and should ease some of that burden. So thank you all for coming, and um, John Michael Cross from EESI is going to give introductions of the panel. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to... The doors are locked. Sorry. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, start this morning with uh, Dr. Patrick Gonzalez, uh, who is a forest ecologist and serves as a National Park Service climate change scientist. Uh, he conducts research on ecological impacts of climate change and works with the national park managers to adapt natural resource management to climate change. He earned his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, and has worked as a scientist for the U.S. Geological Survey and the University of California Center for Forestry. He has served as a lead author for the U.S. National Climate Assessment and the IPCC. Dr. Gonzalez? When I, <clears throat> when I was eight years old, um, my mom and dad piled the family into the station wagon for a summer vacation, and uh, five kids in all. And my dad drove us from Ohio across the country to Colorado and up to Rocky Mountain National Park. And, of course, we enjoyed hiking, seeing bears, uh, the beautiful scenery. Even as a kid, I loved trees. So one thing I remember particularly were the, the mountainsides clothed in, in these green forests of pines and that, that great scent of pine. 38 years later, I returned to Rocky Mountain National Park with those, as an employee of the National Park Service, and those memories were in my mind. But instead, I found uh, hillsides that were patchy and, and covered with uh, a forest that had turned brown. Because in the intervening years, temperatures in Rocky Mountain National Park had increased a degree Celsius, or two degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And this allowed mountain pine beetles to survive winters, to move farther up in elevation into forests that had previously had not, had not known them. And the mountain pine beetles bore under the bark and, and kill extensive stands of trees. And um, this is just one of the impacts of climate change in the southwestern United States. And today I'm going to present uh, published scientific information reviewing the historical and projected climate change and ecological impacts in the southwestern U.S. And um, we'll cover it in these four, uh, these four section, uh, sections, historical and future, climate and uh, ecological impacts. Historical climate trends. Now, this, this graph is going to show the progress of, of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is the main gas regulating the temperature of the Earth. Um, this axis starts 800,000 years ago and goes up to um, 2010, uh, about today. And this axis is the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you can see that in geologic time, 
uh, carbon dioxide goes up and down following orbital cycles. But you see that straight line at the very end that goes straight up. That's 200 years of industrial human history. Um, and carbon dioxide has gone way above the, uh, the natural range of variability uh, to 400 parts per million. Now, what has caused it to go that high? Well, every year, uh, our cars, power plants, and deforestation pump 9 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere. But oceans and forests and soil can only naturally withdraw uh, or absorb 5 billion tons. So 9 billion tons goes up into the atmosphere, 5 billion tons uh, is naturally absorbed, and the balance, 4 billion tons, remains and accumulates in the atmosphere. And it's this fundamental imbalance that is causing climate change. Consequently, temperatures have increased to their warmest levels in 1,200 years, and um, and analyses of the different factors that could cause the increase in temperature, El Nino, volcanoes, solar cycles, uh, our emissions from, from cars and power plants and deforestation, and the influence of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, analyses of each of these factors compared to what we actually observe show that it's our emissions of greenhouse gases from cars, power plants, and deforestation that is causing climate change. Human activities are causing climate change. Scientific agreement on that for, for many years. Across the, the southwestern United States then, in the past century, uh, 1901 to 2002, um, uh, temperature has increased up to uh, up to two to four uh, degrees Celsius, or four to eight degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and we see the greatest warming here in um, in Arizona and um, in in Southern California. And up there, the graph from NOAA shows shows the statistically significant trend in the six uh, southwestern United States. Climate change is also. Uh, altering the patterns of rainfall and snowfall around the world. And we see here in the southwestern United States some areas of statistically significant increase in precipitation, but a large area of drought caused by climate change in the, in the southwestern United States. So that was the historical climate trends. How does that translate on the ground in nature? Well, in the Rocky Mountains and across the western United States, climate change has reduced winter snowfall by about 7% since uh, 1950, including here in Rocky Mountain National Park. And uh, climate change has also advanced warmth, uh, spring warmth, into winter by about a week since 1950 including here at uh, Sequoia, uh, Sequoia National Park in California. And um, one thing I, I uh, intended to, to say at the beginning was all of these results are from published scientific research that detected changes in the, in, in the environment, in ecosystems, and, and looked at different causal factors and attributed the changes to human climate change. So, uh, so that's what these examples are, the major impacts in the Southwest. Uh, quite notably, wildfire, where an analysis of a century of historic uh, wildfire records and climate data show that climate has dominated all other factors in explaining the extent of, uh, of wildfire here in uh, 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 the Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico and across the, uh, the southwestern United States. And as I talked about in, in my introduction, uh, climate change has contributed to uh, outbreaks of mountain pine beetles and other beetles that are killing 
force across the southwest and across the, the western, uh, all of western North America. And in fact, um, ha climate change has contributed to the worst outbreaks in 125 years. So the combination of pine beetles, bark beetles, drought, and wildfire has actually doubled tree mortality in the western United States, including uh, here in Rocky Mountain National Park. In Yosemite National Park, field research has shown that climate change is shifting vegetation upslope and also shifting the ranges of, of small mammals upslope because um, as the temperature warms, the, 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 uh, the warmth moves up to higher and higher elevations. And climate change has uh, also heated water in the oceans, expanding the water, and melted ice from, uh, from land that has drained into oceans. <clears throat> and the, com <clears throat> the combination of that has raised sea level about this much uh, since 1855. Um, here in San Francisco, where uh, the National Park Service hosts the, the tidal gauge right here with the longest time series in the Western Hemisphere, uh, operated, by, <clears throat> operated by NOAA and, and hosted by the National Park Service. So, those were the, the historical climate and the historical uh, ecological impacts. Now we'll look at the future. And, um, uh, hold on, don't, don't do it. Um, so, um, so uh, NOAA and a lot of other uh, scientific groups around the world have used atmospheric models um, to model what might happen under certain scenarios if we don't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, under certain scenarios of economic, and, uh, uh, economic output and energy use. And so what this, uh, what this movie is going to show, it's going to show the, the, the progression of, of temperatures from 2015, hold on, <laughs> uh, from 2015 uh, up until towards the end of the century. Go ahead. And we see the darkest, uh, darkest reds actually represent about 7 degrees Celsius or uh, um, uh, 15, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, quite substantial increases in, in, um, in temperature. And precipitation, you can show it. The darkest blues here are uh, increases of of over 25 percent, and the darkest browns are decreases of over 25 percent. And we see here in the southwest, um, uh, of course, it, it varies, it varies uh, over space, but a lot of the southwest covered by projected decreases in, pre in precipitation. And overall, if we take the six southwestern uh, states as, as a whole, the um, the projection is for uh, a two to, to four and a half degree increase in temperature if we don't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and an overall uh, decrease in precipitation, so more, more drought. Now, we've already experienced uh, some of this in the past century, 0 0.9 degrees Celsius or 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit, and that might not seem like a lot, but, um, but this amount of warming is the equivalent of, of, of pushing a mountain down about 150 meters or, or the, about the height of the Washington Monument from areas of cooler temperature to areas of warmer temperature. Or it's the, it's the equivalent of taking a town um, like Pueblo, Colorado, and moving it southward to the, to the New Mexico border from areas that are cooler to, to areas that are slightly warmer. So very small changes in precipitation, um, very small changes in temperature can lead to substantial changes on the ground. Okay, so finally, 
um, how, to, how do those projections of climate uh, translate into uh, potential impacts on the ground? Well, uh, hotter summers are already increasing wildfires in uh, mid-elevation conifer forests across the West. Uh, field research shows, shows this. Um, oh, and this is uh, in the Gila National Forest in, in New Mexico. And here's the, the Rim Fire just last year near Yosemite National Park. And uh, this map shows uh, fire projections for the end of the century under the, the hottest scenario. And the hottest reds here are an increase of uh, about 25%. And we see actually uh, much of Colorado here, the Sierra Nevada, California, um, projections of increased fire across the Southwest. Climate change may reduce Colorado River stream flow 10 to 45% by 2055 uh, if we don't reduce our, our um, greenhouse gas emissions. And we're going to hear later uh, some of the potential impacts on, on water resources from uh, uh, my colleague here. And uh, drought from climate change is causing extensive dieback in the um, in the, uh, the pinon pine woodlands in a, uh, uh, of the southwest, including here in uh, Bandelier National Monument. And increasing temperatures uh, may lead to even more dieback um, uh, in southwestern woodlands and forests. And uh, Joshua trees... Joshua tree small tree, which is this uh, uh, plant species right here, are highly vulnerable to death in Joshua Tree Capital T National Park and across three quarters of their range due to climate change. Now, when climate change um, kills trees, alters stream flow, alters the patterns of ecology and, and wildlife, um, American Indians, who depend very much on uh, uh, natural resources in the environment and actually uh, have a lot of cultural significance in a lot of species um, uh, in natural areas, um, will also f uh, may also feel the, the impacts of, uh, of these changes. Uh, the American pika which lives at the, in the rocky areas at the, at the highest elevation, is vulnerable to losing its habitats from warming uh, as warming shifts up mountains and, and moves their habitat completely off the top of mountains. And in desert areas, as adapted as cacti and, and other uh, desert plants are to, to hot conditions, um, even they are vulnerable to death here in Saguaro National Park in, in Arizona and uh, across the Southwest. And, and finally, this map uh, shows the results of a vulnerability analysis that uh, I and colleagues ha have published. And it's the vulnerability of ecosystems to these whole scale changes in the biome or um, the, the most fundamental vegetation in an ecosystem. And so it changes from forest to grassland or changes from grassland to, to desert. The biggest changes in an e that can occur in an ecosystem. And you see here the red areas are high or very highly vulnerable. And we see uh, in the southwest, especially the sky islands in, in Arizona and in southern California uh, and in other parts of California, very high uh, to a high vulnerability of those ecosystems to this fundamental change. And uh, in response, the, the National Park Service has developed an, uh, a strategy for how to respond that has these four components, science, that is um, conducting applied research on the ground to answer resource managers' questions. How do we manage national parks in a, in a time of climate change? Adaptation, how to improve the resilience of ecosystems, mitigation, 
how do we actually uh, reduce the cause of climate change by, um, by reducing the emissions from our vehicles and improving the energy efficiency of our operations and communication um, using the national parks and natural areas as classrooms to, to help uh, kids understand and uh, all, all types of visitors understand that the future is in our hands. None of these projections are inevitable. Uh, a billion small actions cause the problem and only a billion small solutions can help solve it. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, I, uh, his uh, presentation slides were not available uh, as a handout up front, but they will be posted on our website at eesi.org. Uh, we have a web page for each of our briefings where you can find uh, the full video of today's uh, briefing, as well as uh, slides and other resources. Uh, so uh, that the full website, the, all the features of that page should be available uh, sometime early next week. The slides will be up uh, this afternoon. Uh, and in my uh, putting too much attention to the door earlier, I uh, neglected to uh, thank Eleanor and uh, all of uh, Congresswoman DeGette's office, uh, uh, both for their leadership on these issues and also for uh, helping uh, today's event happen. Couldn't have done it uh, without them. Uh, next up is uh, Chris Trees, who is the manager of external affairs for the Colorado River Water Conservation District. Uh, more commonly known today as the River District. Chris manages a department that is responsible for the River District's legislative and regulatory governmental relations in Denver and D.C., as well as the District's water education and public information efforts. Uh, in short, uh, Chris describes his job responsibilities as everything you don't want lawyers and engineers doing. Uh, and then I'll, I'll just say that uh, uh, Chris was... Uh, uh, very gracious, very flexible uh, with his travel to uh, join us uh, here today. Some of you may know that we had to cancel, uh, and all our speakers were very flexible. Uh, uh, we had to uh, cancel our briefing originally scheduled for February because it was one of our uh, oh so glorious snow days this year. Uh, and the irony of a briefing called Drier and Hotter Managing Climate Risks in the Southwest uh, being canceled due to snow was not lost on us, uh, but just in case it was, uh, many people emailed to make sure we knew about the irony of, of, of that. So thank you if that was any of you. Uh, all right, Chris? Welcome, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, EESI, -E for the invitation. Um, so... I'm the practitioner. I'm the one who has to deal with whatever the future is. And all we really know is that it's an uncertain future. Um, whether you're a climate denier or a doubter, um, if you know anything about the arid southwest, you know ours is a history of drought and flood. Ours is a history not just of annual drought and flood, but prolonged multi-year, multi-decade periods of drought and periods of plenty. Um, accordingly, and, and you saw from Patrick's slides that the Southwest is ground zero for uh, reduced precipitation, um, as well as some increased temperatures, all of which is going to impact my world, which is water management. Um, and the Colorado River Basin, so you saw the seven states of the Colorado River Basin, the Colorado River Basin is a story of, it's a binary story. We have 90% of the water originating in the upper basin. 90% of the people live and are served by the Colorado River in the lower basin, both in the United States and Mexico. Um, you see here, importantly, that not only is there service within the basin, but here is from Pueblo that was mentioned earlier to Fort Collins and Cheyenne and Wyoming, uh, Salt Lake City, and all of the greater L.A. basin from the international border up to Ventura is all served outside the natural basin of the Colorado River by the Colorado River. Denver in Colorado receives 50% of its water 
from the West Slope, from where I live, from the Colorado River. Uh, 75% of Colorado Springs relies on the Colorado River for service outside the basin. Similarly, Los Angeles and the, the greater LA basin relies on water both from the Colorado River and from Northern California for most of its water supply. So we demand a lot of our water resources in the arid Southwest. Um, the Colorado River Basin, not today, but in the future, this is what we're looking at. Um, it will remain seven states, and the size won't change, but the demands will. Uh, we're going to have more than double the population. Uh, we're going to see that the irrigated acreage, just by virtue of the growth in population, that the irrigated acres will be displaced uh, by, by housing. Um, and that we are looking at, conservatively, a reduction in the supply due to climate change, due to climate change and simply a return perhaps to what, is his, what we now know to be historically a more normal uh, hydrology. Um, additionally, and this isn't new, but there is some new or recent recognition that not only do we have seven basin states, but we have sovereign nations um, from the Native Americans to, to work with and address as well as the Republic of Mexico. So we need to plan for that future. One of the things that was recently completed uh, was the Colorado River Basin Study. This is a cooperative study that was, uh, that was published by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation composed by the seven basin states and the Bureau of Reclamation cooperatively that involved extensive scenario planning about the future, future growth and future, notably, climate change. Um, and that's only a, roughly a year old now, um, and to ensure that it didn't end up just being another very good, fascinating study sitting on a shelf, um, there are three action teams and some other efforts that have arisen from that uh, that are ongoing. And I want to talk to you just, I want to spend three slides on talking about what the conclusions were from this study. Um, that the imbalances between supply and demand, the haves and the have-nots, will continue to grow. There are no silver bullets for answering the questions, for addressing the gap between supply and demand. It is going to take a basket of responses that we are all going to have to speak a common language, some of which has been helped by the Basin Study and the cooperative efforts to, uh, to achieve the Basin Study and publish that report, um, that the current demands outstrip the supply already. We're not talking about the future. Right now, demand exceeds supply on a basin-wide basis. Um, the, the current gap is covered by storage. We have the two largest reservoirs in the United States in Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Those serve the arid southwest and we are drawing them down. Future actions are needed uh, to change that direction. Um, in the lower basin, they are already overusing their available and legal supply. It is a matter of when, not if. In the upper basin, it is not, it is, the, the imbalance is not there now, but it is a greater than 0% chance that it will occur and planning is needed. Um, for the upper basin, the issue is hydrology. What is that future precipitation pattern? For the lower basin, it's how are they going to manage their demands. Um, the basin study, as I mentioned, looked at scenarios. And the only thing that's important here is that the red lines, the red squiggles, these are all future projections. These are all the scenarios of future water demand. The blue is water supply, reflects a great deal of uncertainty, but notably that you look at the preponderance of demands and the preponderance of supply scenarios, demand exceeds supply. Um, so 
we need options. We need to look at how we're going to deal with this. And I mentioned that we have some action groups, and they are dealing with these issues. One, if you're talking about demand and reducing that demand, you're talking about conservation. We're looking at new supplies, whatever they might be, how, and what are the institutional changes, what are the uh, governance issues, not just legal but institutional, cooperation, breaking down some barriers. Um, is water development in its traditional form of constructing a dam, building new supplies, or can we, uh, can we find some new ways of, uh, on that old theme of storing water, are there groundwater resources that can be augmented, that can be supplemented, uh, and then drawn? So this is the, my gratuitous climate change, um, or my gratuitous uh, uh, hydrology, and then the look at current conditions. And I will tell you that it's still, it's hard not to, your eye not to be attracted to the red in the southwest. Um, the good news is that this slide that was prepared for the February presentation looks a lot better than the slide back in February. So there's, a, there's less red, uh, notably in California, but it is still predominantly red. So one of the things we're looking at, um, this is only the upper basin, but we're looking at how do we manage our biggest reservoirs? What can be done um, to deal with the, the supply-demand imbalance? <clears throat> Excuse me. So something we're calling contingency planning, and it is going on now. This is not an exercise for what may happen in the future. This is a current practice, a current effort to look at what are we going to do when Lake Powell <clears throat> doesn't get to zero. That's not the critical level. Critical level is only about 50 to 70 feet in elevation below <clears throat> where the current lake levels are. That's when it falls below where the Bureau of Reclamation, the Western Area Power Administration, can draw water and produce hydroelectricity. At that point, when you're no longer producing hydroelectricity, you're no longer providing preference power to the Western Area Power Administration, to farmers and ranchers and communities throughout the Southwest. You're no longer providing funds for the Colorado River Salinity Program. You're no longer providing federal funds for the Colorado River Endangered Fish programs, and a variety of other programs, including the Grand Canyon, uh, the efforts to, uh, to restore uh, the environment in the Grand Canyon. So can we look at some of the, it's only 3 million or 4 million acre feet compared to 26 million acre feet in Lake Powell, but can we look at Flaming Gorge? Can we move some of that water down so we increase the levels? It's obviously not a permanent solution, but, uh, but it, it will help us in managing the river and managing for the future. Just some of the things we're looking at. So Lake Powell, you've got uh, a history of Lake Powell from uh, 1992. Here's the last time it was full was 1998. That's also the last time that the Colorado River reached the Gulf of California, physically reached the water, reached the Gulf of California until today or tomorrow, excitingly. Um, but... What you have there from 2000 on, this is the drought we've been living in in the southwest. Um, we then got a wonderful year, and we've had a chance to increase some of our storage for a few years, but now you see us dropping right back down at an elevation now of uh, about 3,500, 3,600 feet. Um, in Lake Mead, we have a similar situation, but more dramatic. Um, we had one or two good years where hydrology, the, simple, the, the snow in the upper basin, provided for a boost in Lake, Powell, in Lake Mead levels, excuse me, but you see the overall, uh, the overall trend is a decline, and that is the over-demand, the excess of demand over supply in the lower basin. So Lake, Lake Mead's water budget um, is simply that inflow is about nine, Outflow, we're running about uh, almost 10. Evaporation off Lake Mead is half a million acre feet. We have a structural deficit, if you can call it that, of over a million acre feet a year. Um, so we're looking at, you know, what are we going to do? We can either rely on hope for change. Um, that's just fingers crossed. That doesn't work particularly well. So we're looking again at decre decreased uses, 
voluntary or incentivized demand management, uh, improve some fish- system efficiencies, reoperate some of our reservoirs to improve storage. Uh, we know that the past will not be the future, but the past is all we have to rely on as we look toward the future. So we're trying to build on both the information of the past as well as the mistakes of the past. So an opportunity to provide a congressional briefing, I'm going to take the opportunity to make some specific asks. Um, so here we want greater cooperation with, with the federal agencies across the states and, uh, and across water users um, in the full geography of the basin. Excuse me. Um, we need demand management pilot programs to provide those incentives. We, will, uh, we need water reuse, conservation, and other new supplies. We need to be flexible. We need to be creative. Um, and I think we need some bipartisanship here in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. I just had to ask. So it, it's going to take a, a lot of people. It's going to take um, a lot of creativity. Um, it, this was a much nicer slide when, I was, uh, when it was Valentine's Day and we were presenting in February. So. I, I thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, next is Margaret Bowman, uh, who is the Acting Environment Program Director at the Walton Family Foundation, uh, which resu- pursues lasting conservation, conservation solutions for oceans and rivers while recognizing the role these waters play in the livelihoods of those who live and work nearby. Uh, core focus of Margaret's work is ensuring healthy river flows in the Colorado River. Prior to joining the foundation in 2008, Margaret directed the Lenfest Ocean Program at the Pew Charitable Trust. And for over a decade, she worked at American Rivers uh, with various titles, including Vice President for Conservation. Margaret? Thanks, John Michael, and thanks EESI for sponsoring this briefing. By now, you've um, gotten a lot of information about the challenges in the West due to climate change. I'm not going to go into any more detail about those challenges. What I'd like to talk about is how we respond to those challenges. Um, And I want to focus on water issues. I'd, I'd like you to leave this briefing today remembering two things. The first is that there's a water crisis in the West. Um, and as a result, business as usual has got to change, and it's got to change now. But second, I I want you to remember that this is a crisis that is solvable. And if we take action now, there are solutions that exist that we can provide economic, social, and ecological benefits through our solutions. I work for the Walton Family Foundation. This is founded by the Walmart icon, Sam Walton, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, Our work on on water is focused in the Colorado River Basin, so I'm going to be focusing my remarks on that, but it is applicable. uh, My solutions are applicable throughout the West. At the Foundation, we have a vision uh, for the future in the Colorado River Basin. In that vision, the region's agricultural industry will be modernized with more efficient irrigation technologies. And this modernization will not only increase the productivity of agriculture, but will also result in a surplus of water that farmers can voluntarily sell or lease uh, to cities or for in-stream flows. In our, va- in our vision, the cities of the basin manage their water supplies smartly and with improved efficiency and recycling technologies. Residents transform their landscaping to look like the beautiful, arid western landscapes where they live rather than eastern greengrass communities. With these changes, cities can become more resilient to unpredictable weather, and they're not as rend- they won't be rendered bankrupt uh, due to expensive and environmentally damaging Rube Goldberg plans to pipe water in from faraway lands. In our vision, the iconic rivers of the Colorado River Basin remain healthy and resilient. And as a result, the region's $26 billion recreation and tourism industry continues to grow. And residents looking for our high quality of life are attracted to the basin to work. Fish and wildlife are healthy in our vision. And as a result, the region is not subjected to divisive and expensive Endangered Species Act fights that are um, the, the bane of other basins' existence. And finally, in our vision, cities, towns, federal and state agencies, water utilities, farmers and ranchers, tribes and conservationists 
all work together to adapt our system of managing water so that we are, our energy can be spent on sharing our water most effectively rather than litigating old disputes. With a more fluid market for sharing water, pardon the pun, private capital can be attracted into investing in the region's water solutions. Added to federal and state funding, this private investment can finance the infrastructure improvements that are needed to transform our West. This may be a bold vision, but it's not a crazy one. All of it is achievable. And for the most part, the solutions in our vision are already being experimented with at the local level. What we need now is the political will to scale these changes up to the regional level. About a year ago, as Chris Treese mentioned, the U.S. Department of Interior released uh, a collaborative water supply and demand study for the Colorado River Basin. And they concluded that by 2060, the gap between water supply and demand in the basin will be greater than 3.2 million acre feet. We've done some number crunching, and we believe that there's enough water to meet those projected water gaps in the Colorado Basin states if we invest in a few critical solutions. First, we need to upgrade irrigation infrastructure in the basin and implement other agricultural water saving techniques. And we need to utilize water banking mechanisms to bank and then share this saved water throughout the basin. Voluntarily impl implemented irrigation efficiency, deficit irrigation, and other innovative, innovative irrigation technologies are concepts that many farmers are already using in the basin. Combined with, these water saving te combined with these water saving techniques, water banking is a market-based approach that allows farmers and others to bank their unused water voluntarily. This saving for a non-rainy day approach is a common sense way of making our water supplies more resilient in the basin. We estimate that one million acre feet of saved water can be generated from agriculture in the basin while keeping farming and ranching a vibrant part of the region's economy. Farmers and ranchers need to stay on their land, not only to grow food, but also to maintain the Western culture and landscape of the region. And from an environmental standpoint, farmers often call water down the river rather than having it sent out of the basin to distant cities. Without farms, a lot more rivers would be dry. Second, we need our cities to ensure that they use their water as efficiently as possible so that they can continue to grow while living within their water means. Water efficiency programs have worked time and time again and usually represent, it, represent the lowest cost and fastest option for new water supply. We estimate that one million acre feet of additional water savings can be gained through urban water efficiency. Conservation can occur through improved landscaping techniques, requirements that new construction be water efficient, and other conservation approaches. In addition, municipal water audits routinely result in dramatic savings. Third, we need to stretch our water supplies further through recycling. Wastewater, stormwater, and gray water can be treated and reused for irrigation, industrial processing and cooling, and even in many places for potable use. In addition, recycled water can be used to maintain river flows and to replenish groundwater supplies. Our analysis estimates 1.2 million acre feet can be gained through these recycling approaches in the basin. The estimated savings from these three solutions may be enough to fill the projected water gap in the Colorado Basin. But to be caution, cautious, Colorado River Basin states should pursue some targeted water augmentation projects. If new solutions are narrowly targeted, to address specific water supply needs and can do so without environmental harm, they can be an important part of the solution. In contrast, large water import schemes are expensive, they're energy intensive, environmentally harmful, and are often not targeted to the locations where water is needed. For the most part, the solutions I've outlined are not untested ideas. Communities across the basin are already using promising practices that can serve as a model to others across the region. Let me just share just a couple examples. Temporary agricultural fallowing arrangements in Yuma, Arizona and Palo Verde, California have generated saved water for urban areas and also cash for farmers without widespread loss of agricultural lands. The town of Sierra Vista, Arizona and the surrounding Cochise County have both passed laws that required certified water efficient appliances in new homes. 
and they're also dedicating recycled water for groundwater recharge near the San Pedro River, reducing the impact of the city's groundwater pumping on the river. And several community leaders across the West have banded together into a network called the Western Adaptation Alliance. Through this, communities are comparing approaches to water efficiency and recycling and exploring other ways to make their water supplies more secure and adaptable. Efficiency, recycling, and carefully targeted water augmentation solutions can generate the water needed to meet the Colorado Basin's future needs. What may be the, the hardest part of our vision is taking the first steps to make that happen. It's building the political will in the region to work together to craft these solutions. A key lesson from the extreme weather events of the past few years is that our communities and economies are interdependent. Solving the region's urban water needs by drying up agriculture will end up harming cities due to the lack of food supply, and also the local economy will be disrupted. Further draining rivers to meet water needs will harm the important tourist economy, tour tourism economy and make communities in the region desi undesirable places to live. Working together to stretch and share the region's water supplies may be difficult, but it is the only solution that will ensure a resilient region into the future. Just this week, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its most recent report on climate changes. It's focused on adaptation. The report identified a lot of freshwater-related risks from climate change, particularly in the West, as we've heard today. But it also highlighted the need for flexible and low-regret solutions that can build resilience to climate change. And it highlighted resilience strategies that can provide co-benefits for human health, livelihoods, social and economic well-being, and environmental quality. Also this week, an exciting collaborative restoration experiment occurred in the Colorado River Delta in Mexico. And this experiment highlights the co-benefits of resilient solutions that are mentioned in the IPCC report. A pulse flow of water, also known as a managed flood, was released into the dry riverbed of the Colorado in Mexico. This experiment was designed to restore riverside trees and wetlands for birds and other wildlife. But it was just one result of a groundbreaking international agreement between the U.S. and Mexico that was signed in 2012. This five-year agreement also provided additional water for California, Arizona, and Nevada, and committed Mexico to work in the U with the U.S. in times when reductions in water supply are needed. It's too soon to know the ecological results of this experiment. We must wait for the floodwaters to recede to understand that. But the social benefits of this experiment are already quite clear. Hundreds of residents of the Mexican town of San Luis Rio, Colorado, a town whose name includes their lost river, they've been out celebrating the river's return. Young children who have never seen the river were playing in the water. Elders who remember the river before Hoover Dam was built were watching the river return. And teenagers were dancing in the river, yelling, thank you, America, for bringing back our river. And perhaps equally exciting to this, state and federal officials from both sides of the border were celebrating an increased level of cooperation. And hopefully they were looking for the next opportunity to design agreements to share water to make whole, the whole region more resilient. The old adage rings true with our water supply, a stitch in time saves nine. If we can develop the courage to work together today to address our shared water needs, we can not only address these challenges in a more cost-effective fashion that brings benefits to all involved, but we can also avoid the divisive battles that break down the interdependent strings that will keep our region resilient into the future. Over a century ago, the West was built by innovative pioneers working together to harness the region's natural resources. We can't build our way out of the current water supply challenges the way those pioneers built their early water systems. There simply isn't enough water left. But it is time to reinvigorate that pioneering spirit. It is time to transform the West again. But this time we need to transform it into the most water efficient region in the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you for mentioning the IPCC, uh, which is, uh, Working Group 2 just came out uh, in the last couple of days. Working Group 3 will be out soon. Uh, and I also wanted to mention uh, the, the National Climate Assessment, 
uh, which in, in many ways is the uh, United States version of the IPCC. Uh, uh, we'll be out in approximately one month, the final version. Uh, uh, the draft of the, of the latest one has been out for approximately one year. And uh, one of the things we wanted to do, and, and uh, uh, this briefing is really the kickoff of a series looking at different regions uh, of the United States and what the national climate has to say uh, about those. And we're certainly getting into a lot more than just uh, the NCA. But uh, we don't have the next one scheduled yet, but uh, be on the lookout soon uh, uh, for more briefings uh, in different regions. Uh, finally today, before we move to an extended Q&A, uh, we have uh, Louis Blumberg who is the director of the Climate Change Program for the Nature Conservancy's California chapter. He has been uh, directly involved in the development of climate policy in California for more than a decade. Uh, prior to joining the Nature Conservancy in 2004, uh, Lewis served as the deputy director of external affairs for the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Lewis? for the opportunity to be here today. Um, there's a Secret Service agent standing in a field in the Central Valley. This was February uh, two months ago. So what is the Secret Service agent doing there? Well, President Obama came to look at California's drought. We're having, we're three years into a drought. I can't say if it's the middle of the drought or the end of the drought or the beginning, but we're having a drought. Um, and we know that climate change is making the drought worse. Um, and if we didn't know that for already, we got a reminder on Monday with, with the release of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. So we need to take action now. That's one of the lessons from the report. Uh, and we know that the longer we wait, the more difficult it will be to address the problem uh, and the more costly it will be. And at the Nature Conservancy, we believe nature is a powerful tool in the fight against climate change. There are three essential strategies to address climate change. One is to reduce emissions, the cause of the problem. One is to restore carbon, return it back to the trees and the, the earth from uh, where the disparity came that Patrick talked about. And the third is to respond to the impacts. And nature plays a role in all three. And often you, get, you can address all three strategies with one action. So we need action now. And I, I would agree with Eleanor, Congress has a role. We all in the room have a role to play. Um, we need to, to plan now um, and get projects going and get activity happening. And I'm really pleased with Margaret's uh, positive, uh, hopeful stories uh, of her talk because things are happening. Um, and we know that nature needs to be a part of it. We know that natural infrastructure works. It can reduce risks from climate magnified extreme events, and it can, com and it can provide the multiple benefits uh, that are essential. So I'm gonna talk about three themes here. Um, first around some of the water issues in California. The second is around natural infrastructure reducing climate risk. And the third is California's response um, to the, the current situation. Um, and the three themes are, are gonna be kind of interwoven here. We know that um, we know that the state um, is doing much. There's a lot going on in its response to the drought. A lot of this has been sort of emergency planning. We've had a, a declaration of emergency by the governor, um, a drought task force, legislation passed that allows um, movement of water more quickly. But it's like the state went out to buy a fire extinguisher while the fire was burning. This is not really going to get the job done. In the long run, we need to plan ahead. We need to manage better in advance. This means conserving water resources in times of drought um, so that we have them when we need them. We need to make sure that we avoid no harm. In the late 80s, California had another drought and increased pumping significantly in the Delta that caused a lot of environmental damage. And we also need to deploy natural solutions. So what does that mean? In, in, the, in California, that means like in the Sierra Nevada mountains and other mountain headwaters, we need to restore degraded forests and meadows so that they can act as a sponge like they do and, and hold water uh, and release it in the, in the dry parts of the year. 
We need to do ecologically based thinning of the unhealthy forests, as Patrick talked about, to reduce the catastrophic wildfires that are increasing all the time. Along our rivers, we need to connect, reconnect the rivers to their natural floodplains. This can help recharge groundwater basins. And in the California Delta and other estuary, estuaries, restoring marshes and wetlands can reduce the risk of levee failure protecting communities and farms, um, can reduce the risk of flooding, and can enhance environmental, environmental benefits for fish, birds, uh, while increasing water supply reliability for 25 million Californians. And even in the tropics, there's a role for nature here, uh, for California's water. So the protection of the rainforest is critical for our water supply. One recent study found that the deforestation of the Amazon would decrease the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada by 50%. And we also know that the, the forest, tropical forests of the globe provide the water, much of the water that flows into the temperate regions in California through these what are called atmospheres river events that bring a lot of our rainfall. So nature is a powerful tool in addressing these, these climate risks. And the climate risks in California are well known and they're common. We've, we've had wildfire, floods, coastal erosion, and drought. <clears throat> and we know from the IPCC report, if we didn't know it already, that these are going to get more frequent and more extreme. Um, and so we're promoting, again, nature, natural infrastructure as a solution. This is the Yolo Bypass near Sacramento. It was a flood risk reduction project that, that can reduce the risk of floods, which the climate will increase, to the city of Sacramento in the background. But it provides also many other multiple benefits, many other benefits like clean water, fish and wildlife habitat, uh, recreation, um, natural infrastructure can increase property values and build community support. Uh, it avoids the carbon dioxide emissions that come with building concrete levees. And in this case, there's farming as well on the land uh, where there's rice growing at certain times of year. So we looked at what's happening in California, and we produced a new report, and I'm pleased to say I have a few copies with me here today, um, about reducing climate risks um, with natural infrastructure in California. Case, nine case studies. What we found in the report is that people are doing it. This works. It's proven. Um, and it's also cost effective. Uh, it's flexible and doesn't lock you into concrete solutions. Um, it provides multiple benefits and it builds community support. So what's going on in California um, in terms of climate risk reduction and response planning? And I'm using the term risk reduction and response instead of adaptation. Um, I think that's, the adaptation terms to me is, is problematic. So California has is, is got a lot of activity going on in addition to the, the, the drought response. There are over 20 plans, either complete or most of them underway, that deal with climate response in some way. Um, different departments, different agencies, they're, they're all over the place here. And the one John Michael asked me to talk about is the Safeguarding California Plan. And this plan has, um, um, it's, it's in draft form. It was released in December. Comments closed uh, Valentine's Day, and it's, we hope it'll be finished by May. It's fairly large. It's a textbook of information, uh, a lot of description of risk, of, of what's happened. Uh, where it's weak is on the spe specificity of the action items. Now, looking at the water issue, which we've been talking about today, the plan is good on, on a couple of issues. It talks well about flood risk reduction and the strategies to do that. And it really raises the importance of groundwater management um, in a way that has not happened in California. So there's an active conversation about groundwater in California now, uh, which is not adjudicated in our state. So it's important to manage groundwater in wet years so that we can turn to those reserves in dry years and to manage them in a sustainable yield and conjunctive use with surface water, with monitoring and adapting when needed. Now, many of the other recommendations in this report are very general and, and nonspecific. Um, and so overall, the, 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 the plan here lacks specificity, it lacks timelines, and it lacks, lacks, lacks metrics. Now, there are two key water-related recommendations that are not in the report that we think should be. The first one is to increase 
above the dam natural water storage. And again, this is through building resilient forested watersheds. The second is what Chris talked about, is reoperating the water system in the context of climate change. Historically, we look at each individual dam in a vacuum, and we need to uh, figure out how to optimize the existing water infrastructure system-wide as a system to provide water for people and nature th through both wet and dry years. So um, we got a group of people together and provided some input to the state on this plan. Um, we have um, science groups and public health groups, environmental groups, and land trusts. Um, and included in our uh, voluminous letter here were four key areas for improvement. And we believe that this plan for the state, if it's going to safeguard California from the impacts of climate change, needs to have really smart actions, actions that are specific, measurable, discrete actions then, that you can report on and that have timelines. We believe that natural infrastructure should be given a preference. There, are, there is good references to natural infrastructure in several places, but it's not coalesced in any um, coherent way, um, and it needs to get, be given a preference. The third is around avoiding hazards. We think it's unwise for the state to spend state dollars building state facilities without understanding what the risks are, and we believe state agencies should not permit new facilities in areas that are high risk uh, from climate impacts. And the fourth, and probably the most challenging, I guess, is to integrate climate change into the standard business practice of the state. This is also a recommendation in President Obama's climate action plan that, was, that he released uh, in the summer. And so we think it's, it's critical that climate change become just part of doing business. Um, and the, the, the rationale, um, the caveat in the state's plan, the safeguarding plan, is they don't have the money or the training. And that's just not acceptable, I guess. They need to figure out how to, how to do this because it's, it's, it's uh, uh, foolish, really, to go um, forward without understanding the climate impacts. So we believe nature is a powerful tool in the fight against climate change. And to harmonize these various state planning efforts and to really give some, um, some sense of cohesiveness, we're promoting a set of climate smart principles for policymakers and planners. And those are to plan ahead to reduce risk, focus on the future, not today, prioritize natural infrastructure, which I've talked a lot about, collaborate better across sectors, take actions that produce multiple benefits, you've heard a lot about that today, and address greenhouse gas emissions, reduce them, quantify them, pay attention to the impacts that we have when we, uh, when we act, and employ adaptive and flexible approaches. So the benefits are clear. We can reduce climate magnified risks to people, communities, and our environment, and we can generate a bushel baskets of additional public and private benefits. We need to act now. The longer we wait, the more difficult and expensive it will be. The question that for us here in this room is, will we act soon enough and with enough force that we leave a world that in some way resembles that with which civilization evolved? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lewis. Uh, uh, before I open up to, uh, to the audience, I was wondering if uh, any of our panelists had uh, questions for each other or reactions to uh, some of the different uh, presentations. Thank you for that, and uh, it, it's an honor to be up here with these panelists, fellow panelists. Lewis, I have my own guess, but I want to invite you to talk a little bit more on what, what is involved in natural infrastructure. So natural infrastructure um, is, is using the power of nature to fight climate change. So it's a, it can be a variety of strategies. Uh, active forest management that's ecologically sound can reduce fire risk, can affect fire behavior. Um, strategies like wetland conservation, wetland restoration can, can help buffer coastal communities and other communities uh, and farms from storm surge and, and sea level rise and the suite of coastal hazards that, that um, uh, is involved and exacerbated by climate change. Um, issues like restoring natural floodplains, 
building, repairing, restoring, repairing vegetation along rivers. All of these activities can help reduce flood risks, which we know will get more, uh, more severe. Um, and as I mentioned, restoring forest watersheds helps with water supply as well. So it's all a system, not a surprise there. Um, and it, using the power of nature is, is important. So in this report, what we've, what we've tried to do here, um, what we've done, is, is talk about a, a gradient. It's not green versus gray. It's not a, a dialectic. It is, it's a whole range of solutions. Uh, so preservation is the simplest, probably the quickest. Restoration is more active, involves some activity. So it's not necessarily green. It's using nature. Um, third on the spectrum would be using structures and nature. Um, and, the, and the fourth would be using structures alone. And we recognize some places will need to be armored to deal with climate risks. But where it's feasible, we believe nature should, should be used. Anyone else? Uh, so uh, open up to the audience. Uh, we, so we, we lack a mobile microphone. Not that big a room. We should be able to hear each other. Uh, but I will be repeating uh, I, the question just for the benefit of our online audience. So uh, any questions? Yes. I have a question for Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, I found your, your presentation both interesting and intriguing. How confident are you of your future Okay, the, the future projections are from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, on which I sit. I'm a lead author for the IPCC. And um, also um, uh, NOAA, the U.S. government, has, has produced um, uh, projections as part of the, the, the group of IPCC um, uh, projections. So... Um, the uh, the uncertainty in 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 projecting the future is and there, there there's two types of uncertainty one is um how is the future going to be what is the population and what uh how will we be using energy will be we be more sustainable or not and then um uh within those types of scenarios um there's another uncertainty and that's how the atmospheric models vary uh, among uh, among them, so for any of our analyses, we quantify those two types of uncertainties. And if you saw some of the results here, I always um, expressed the the future projection as, as as a range. So for the the southwestern U.S., the the projections range from two and a half degrees to four point six uh, degrees. Um, that that accounts for that first uncertainty of of what population and energy use will do, and then within each of those scenarios, we use uh, every single atmospheric model, and certain and and currently there are thirty three different ones, so you can get the average of all of them and see how they agree um, amongst themselves. So. Um, uh, we've quantified the uncertainty, but the bottom line is that through history, we've, we've put enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to, have, um, a, to, to commit us to a certain level of, of climate change. And, and up until now, the, the, the global temperature has increased uh, about eight-tenths of a degree Celsius, or about uh, one-and-a-half degrees Fahrenheit. And if we stopped everything right now, the atmosphere would continue to warm at about that same uh, rate. So that's what we're committed to. But above that, our choices in, in how we live and um, the legislation that is passed um, to reduce emissions and to increase energy efficiency can, can prevent us from, from going uh, above that. Was yeah. that you've identified high risk areas uh, based on temperature and precipitation? Yeah. What should be done to forewarn those people who live in high risk areas uh, 
relative to what they can do to prevent certain events from taking place. For instance, wildfires. Um, it, are there any solutions? California has had at least one to two wildfires every year for the past 25 years. There's been no solutions other than the governor declaring a state of emergency. Wildfire uh, is a natural part of ecosystems and we require a certain amount of uh, wildfire, but of course, as you've seen, climate change is increasing the number of catastrophic wildfires, wildfires that get out of, out of control and cause property damage and, and, uh, and kill, kill people. Right. So uh, what the, the National Park Service and the Forest Service and a lot of our partners are doing right now is trying to reduce the, uh, the, the understory by um, and reduce the fuels for fire by uh, reducing the understory. All the small trees that are, uh, that, are, um, that are in the understory of the forest because a century of strict uh, firefighting or fire suppression has caused this unnatural buildup of, of small trees and of fuels in the, in the forests. And that, combined with climate change, is increasing the hazard. So um, our main attack, line of attack here is to reduce the amount of fuel so you have forests that have bigger trees, um, more widely spaced, and, and a clear understory um, that doesn't have this accumulation of, of fuels. So um, the federal government, the state governments are, are collaborating on this um, to, the, to the extent possible. Yeah. Um, that defined uh, uh, the tenderest forest throughout the nation, okay? Has, has the National Park Service used any of that data? Uh, Patrick, just real quick. Uh, Lucy, you had a follow-up? I just want to uh, let, everyone, let everyone else in on the phone. Well, I, yeah, I'll respond to two things. One, one is that in terms of protecting people, um, it's really local county land use decisions that are putting more people at risk of wildfires. They move their, their homes into areas that are at, <coughs> prone to risk. California has designated high fire hazard severity zones. And when you buy a new house in one of those zones and get insurance, they have to tell you that. People still do it, you know. Um, so it's changing a lot of little behaviors is really critical. But there's a role for local government in that. And on the flip side, there's been a good, so optimistic action in Congress where we've seen some bipartisanship on this issue with uh, uh, acts like the Healthy Forest Restoration Act of providing some funding uh, to um, federal agencies and state governments to try to deal with the problem. But, you know, population growth, people moving, it's, it's going to make it very uh, intractable. Thanks, Lewis. Yeah, that's a really important point. And, and another, another way to address this that the, the Park Service states and, and, um, and our partners um, is using prescribed fire or setting fires in a very controlled and scientifically determined way to, um, to mimic the natural fires that have not occurred in, in the past century. Uh, other questions from the audience? Uh, right here? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I was just wondering about uh, population changes. Um, population changes is a variable that you know, is added on to this whole thing we talked about. The Southwest is one of the fastest growing areas of the country in terms of population. Um, I mean, is, is that something that you know, we can try and um, manage? Right. So the question is about uh, population pressures in the region. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, climate change is not our only problem, um, but and population um, growth is is exacerbating the challenge. Uh, I think um, you know the the key question is how you manage that population growth. And uh, you know, Chris and I were actually talking about this right before um, this panel, that one of the really important pieces um, from a water supply perspective, 
Um, we've just heard about a, a key solution on on a, on a fire perspective is you know, let's make sure we're not building um, uh, houses in harm's way. From a water supply perspective, we need to better integrate local land use planning with water supply planning. Right now, they're done by different agencies that rarely talk to each other. Sometimes, you know, some states and, and, and localities do it better than others, but um, that link between water supply and planning has got to be much tighter, and um, that's, you know, that's very much doable. Uh, and even in, in short water supply areas, you can, if you have a, uh, an area that really has reached its limit of water supply now but still wants to grow, um, you can apply some market mechanisms where you say, okay, there's no more water left. If you want to come in, you need to invest in efficiency upgrades on these other houses or on, on these other companies or affect, you know, fix the leakage in this system. And so that new development is helping to fund the efficiency upgrades on, on older um, buildings so that you can grow while living within that same water footprint. But those decisions need to be deeply integrated if we're going to address this. Did, did you want to add anything, Chris? Well, I think, you know, there's obviously two elements to population growth. One is obviously organic growth, births over deaths. Um, the other and the more significant for the arid southwest, as I think you noted, is the in-migration. And so education is an important part of this. It is, uh, I grew up in the east, I'm used to having lots of rain and more water than was desirable at any given time that irrigate, uh, farmers here aren't irrigators, they're, they're drainers. They are moving that water off the field more than applying water to the field. Um, and, and that's a big educational shift. There is a whole different orientation to water. Water is an abundant excess resource in the east. It is a scarce resource in the arid west. But we move to the west and we want to replicate our environments. We plant our trees, we plant our bluegrass lawns to replicate our environments. We need to change, we need to adapt, we need to uh, educate and begin to live as if we are in the arid west, um, as arid westerners. And that's a big change in, in the, you know, institutionally tying land use with water supply planning. It's been our complaint for a long time that throughout Colorado, throughout the arid west, we went through our most severe droughts when we implemented um, on a utility or a city level draconian, truly severe water restrictions, water conservation requirements. And the city council would do that and then meet 15 minutes later as the the land planning commission and hand out land use permits like they were Halloween candy. I mean, there, there's a disconnect in our institutionally between land use and water supply planning and that needs to, we need to marry those two conversations on an intimate level. Great. Well, there's a question right here. Uh, going back to fuels and fuel production, uh, are there policy and legislative challenges in that area because uh, I'm concerned about like wilderness areas where uh, my understanding is you're prohibited from actually doing fuels reductions which causes So, the, uh, so the, thank you. Uh, so the question is about uh, how do we manage our uh, uh, forest f uh, fire fuel better? Yeah, um, uh, two points. Uh, first, you are correct. In wilderness areas, um, the, the federal government is constrained on active management, and that's true for uh, the, national, the national park system. Half of the area of the national parks is in wilderness, and so... What occurs there occurs naturally without, um, uh, for the most part, without active management. And so what I was talking about, active fire management of prescribed uh, burning, occurs um, 
in the other half uh, uh, of the system, which is a still a substantial area. Uh, the, the second uh, point I want to make is, uh, is that um, a lot of fire management is, is wildland fire use or when uh, a fire is ignited naturally by, by lightning and and uh, the Park Service and the Forest Service and other uh, federal agencies have um, organized fire plans, organized and approved fire plans. And if the fire isn't occurring in an area where we've already planned to, to burn, then we can, uh, we can let it burn because it is a natural process. It's, a, it's an essential process for forest ecosystems. And, and the lessons of the big fire in Yellowstone in 1988 are, 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 are very clear that um, that fire is necessary, that a resilient ecosystem can uh, can come back um, uh, just as strong it 's the excessive wildfire from from climate change that we 're trying to avoid. Let me just add too with, with uh, Patrick was talking about the national parks and there also we have national forests um, and and I don't purport to speak for the Forest Service, but my, my sense is that the policies and regu regulations are in place that would allow more of this type of activity. And it's really funding that's the shortfall there. More funding would actually get more acres uh, treated. Uh, I have a question about, uh, especially for those of you on the ground in California and in Colorado, uh, the interaction between the federal level and the state and local level. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, decision making or planning, is, are there ways that uh, that interaction could be improved or things that uh, you all could use? Well, I'll start. I'm sure there are a lot of, a lot of thoughts here. The uh, half of the state of Colorado is federally owned. The, the federal government is a, is a partner by definition. Um, and so uh, the federal government in its responses to uh, water quality to the sedimentation that comes naturally from runoff off BLM lands, relatively dry, usually arid lands, is a necessary part of meeting new stormwater regulations for municipalities. Um, you know, I think there are a host that we've talked about uh, fuel reduction, fire suppression, fire management, um, a major element that addresses the the forest and the, the uh, Bureau of Land Management lands, as well as National Park Service and others. Um, you know, the federal government has a, a large role, in both regulatory and ownership and therefore land management role. Um, and I think that the federal government can provide a number of uh, leadership roles. One, they can lead by example. Two, they can become a partner, become a better partner. I don't mean to suggest that they're not one now, um, but become a better partner in those uh, joint responsibilities for meeting some of our environmental goals, for our water supply goals. Uh, I think there are a variety of opportunities for improvement um, as well as uh, creating some, some new partnerships and some new relationships between the, the non-federal and the federal. Other questions? Eleanor. Just a one big picture question from the first chapter, um, Chris. The basin study, the Bureau of Reclamation Basin Study, says that when the projections for the Colorado were made 100 years ago, it was during a more a wetter cycle, and so it's uh, over uh, predicted, you know, expected that we would have more water than we actually do. Um, where does that If you remember the map um, of changes in the past century of wa uh, in in rainfall precipitation, most of the map was actually blue. That um, the tendency of climate change is is to increase uh, energy in 
in the weather system, and that expresses itself by more storms and, and more rainfall. So actually across North America, 80% uh, of the area has experienced increases in, in rainfall. But it's just uh, the, how uh, the landscape is and how atmospheric processes go that, that uh, the Southwest has experienced a, a, a decline. It's part of the 20% the, the that ex, uh, has experienced a, a decline. And um, so where is the water going? The water is going to, to, to other areas um, that have experienced increases in, in precipitation. And sometimes that expresses itself as, uh, as bigger storms and, and flooding. So you see the, the two extremes that result from climate change, extreme drought in some areas, and then too much water and flooding in other areas. I'm not sure it's entirely on point to your question, but in Colorado, Colorado is obviously arid as well as very wet in its mountain areas, primarily as snow, as you noted. The climate scenarios, the future forecasts for climate change, really have their greatest range of uncertainty right in Colorado, and the dividing line seems to be about that median east-west across Colorado, Interstate 70 cutting east-west uh, seems to be the dividing line, and that is also our experience in Colorado in the recent past. So that, in fact, we may get more precipitation in Colorado as a result of climate change, as a result of the, the scenarios for climate change, but more of that will come as rain than as snow. It will come because it's warmer, and the result of warmer temperatures means that we're going to have a longer growing period, not just for farmers and ranchers, but for the natural environment. The net result, though we may have more water, you're going to have more growth, more uptake, uh, both man-caused and natural, so that the, the net effect is less water, less water in the rivers and earlier water in the rivers. So that's all part of the the planning that we need to do and the changes to some of our institutions, some of our Water rights uh, limit when you can begin to store water behind 100-year-old dams. Those may need to be re-examined. They may need to be, uh, those water rights decrees may need to be amended to address an earlier runoff, a flashier runoff, which will then get to some of the other uh, armoring issues and erosion issues that were mentioned in a, in a coastal context by Lewis. Uh, we're almost out of time, but Margaret, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned a private investment in water infrastructure, and I was wondering if you could uh, say a little bit more about that, and maybe there is, that's happening anywhere right now. Well, um, uh, I remember from my Economics 101 class that when something becomes scarce, the value goes up. And so, yes, there's a lot of interest from um, private investors in water because they think it's going to only increase in value. Uh, I, you know, our interest in, in finding ways to have investors who are interested in water uh, invest in positive solutions rather than speculative investment in water rights that then will uh, result in, um, you know, fallowed farmland and piping water to cities. Uh, and uh, so I, I think there is interest from the investment community in finding the solutions. You know, some of the uh, interest and some of the things we're exploring are um, uh, helping to invest in uh, agricultural um, upgrades and in um, lining of, of ditches, um, switching to a, a more efficient irrigation technologies, um, investing, bringing private investment in for that um, uh, upgrade, and then finding revenue streams to pay that investor back uh, through increased ag productivity, but maybe, maybe you can put solar on um, the ditch while you're, you're lining it and you have returns that way. Um, there are other kind of creative social impact bonds and others to, uh, to find other solutions. Uh, we're also promoting um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an IRS ruling to say that if you um, result in safe <coughs> water and you can dedicate that water in stream, um, you can get a tax write-off for that. So there are creative ways of, of finding those solutions. Um, on the on the um, 
uh, on the agricultural side. Uh, I think it's a very new area, um, and there are some investors out there that are interested in that, um, and, and we're working to kind of see if we can help promote that. Um, there's also private investment opportunities on the, um, on the urban side as well. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure um, transitions that need to be done there and, and opportunities to bring in private financing. Um, and again, we are we're working to you know, find ways to uh, promote the, the positive investments that are needed there. Great. Uh, any last uh, short questions? No? Okay. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, again, uh, the full video, uh, slides, other resources will be available at EESI.org, and we will have uh, other uh, briefings related to looking at regional impacts from climate as well as uh, adaptation strategies for those regions. Uh, we'll be looking at water, but also a number of uh, uh, other issues related to those as well. Also be on the lookout for the release of the final version of the National Climate Assessment, which will have a chapter on the Southwest, as well as, uh, I believe, seven other regions in the United States, uh, as well as chapters on a variety of sectors, public health, water, agriculture. It's going to be a great resource. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd like to just thank our speakers very much, and uh, thank you again.